Hi guys, we are in the middle of discussing the Artha Shastra, and today we discuss in brief the role of women in a Cotillion state. So, as you guys know, that uh, we haven't yet entered the sections written by Chanakya himself. We are still discussing some of the gist areas, a brief setup and introduction by the translator, Mr. Ellen Rangana- Rangarajan himself. Because uh, the way that Arthashastra is written, the sentence construction, the the concepts of paragraph that we know today, have all come from the English language and therefore from the Bible, which was entirely different from the writing styles of uh, Bharat in two thousand three hundred years back. So he gives uh, this, these sections to help us out, uh, to help us understand the book when we uh, get to reading Chanakya's own writings. So this will be a long uh, chapter. Uh, different kinds of uh, topics related to women is discussed in this section the cotillion state and society so first we discuss courtesans courtesans i don't know what's the pronunciation courtesans prostitutes and uh, brothels providing sexual entertainment to the public using prostitutes or ganika was an activity not only strictly controlled by the state but also one which was for the most part carried on in state owned establishments women who lived by their beauty or rupajivas could however entertain men as independent practitioners these could have been allowed to practice these could have been allowed to practice in smaller places which could not support a full-fledged state establishment a third type of women of pleasure mentioned in a few places is pumsachali perhaps meaning concubines as befits a treatise on the economy of a state The emphasis in the Artha Shastra is on the collection of revenue. The state enabled the setting up of establishments with the lump sum grants of thousand pun, which was the currency of the Cotillion state. So, a lump sum grant of thousand puns to the head of courtesans, to the to the head courtesan, the madam as we say, and five hundred pun to her deputy, presumably to enable them to buy jewelry, furnishings, musical instruments, and other tools of their trade. the madam of the estab- establishment had to render full accounts and it was the duty of the chief controller of entertainers to ensure that the net income was not reduced by her extravagance so that she d- herself doesn't spend too much <clears throat> independent prostitutes who were neither given a grant nor required to produce detailed accounts had to pay a tax of 1/6 of their income in times of financial distress both groups had to produce extra revenue with the independents having to pay half their earnings as tax but only financial distress which wasn't not it's not like every day was a financial uh, distress it was a rare occasion the establishments were located in the southern part of the fortified city whenever the army marched on an expedition courtesans also went with them they were allotted places in the camp alongside the roads During battle the women were stationed in the rear with cooked food and drinks encouraging the men to fight uh, encouraging the men to fight It would seem that courtesans not only provided sexual pleasure but also entertained clients with singing and dancing In specifying their duties the Arthashastra makes a clear distinction between two types of misdemeanors showing a dislike towards a client visiting her for formal ent- for normal entertainment and refusing to sleep with him if he stayed overnight The description of the training given to a courtesan at state expense indicates how wide her accomplishments had to be: singing, playing on musical instruments, conversing, reciting, dancing, acting, writing, painting, mind reading, <laughs> preparing perfumes and garlands, shampooing, and of course, the art of love making. A courtesan's son, who had to work as the king's minstrel from the age of eight, was also trained as a producer of plays and dances. It would appear from the above that some families specialized in the entertainment business. <laughs> However, the Artha Shastra specifically states that any beautiful, young, and talented girl could be appointed as the head of an establishment, irrespective of whether she came from a family of courtesans or, n- or not. Once appointed, the madam became a very important person. She could aspire to become the personal attendant of the king or queen. Even otherwise, a very high price, that is twenty-four thousand pun. had to be paid for obtaining her release from her post we must note that the amount was the second highest annual salary paid only to the five top officials like the chief of the king's bodyguards the chancellor and the treasurer 
only such people could afford to buy a madam or uh, to afford could afford could afford to buy a madam off as an exclusive con- concubine if a courtesan was promoted to if a courtesan was promoted to attend on the king her annual salary was fixed as 1000 2000 or 3000 pund depending on her beauty and qualifications 1000 pund was the same salary paid to the king's personal advisers and attendants such as the char- uh, charioteer physician astrologer court poet etc they were paid as much as the uh, as the chief attendant as the chief female escort to the king an interesting point is that the courtesan's establishment could not be inherited by her son on the death retirement or release of the head of an establishment her daughter or sister could de- could take her place or she could promote her deputy and appoint a new deputy if neither the daughter nor the deputy succeeded her the establishment reverted to the state simple pretty pretty solidly and lucidly run uh, a government 2300 years back the state not only imposed obligations on prostitute prostitutes but also protected them having been given a grant by the state and having been allowed to spend a part of her earnings on personal adornment a prostitute could not sell mortgage or entrust her jewelry and ornaments to anyone except the madam prostitutes were obliged to attend on any client when ordered to do so be pleasant to them and not subject them to verbal or physical injury in return stiff punishments were prescribed for anyone cheating or robbing a prostitute abducting her confining her against her will or disfiguring her this is the benefit of legalizing prostitution these things can't be stopped unless it's legalized so while they keep paying some amount of their hafta to the police anyway they could pay that as tax if it was legalized special punishments were also prescribed for depriving a prostitute's daughter of her virginity whether she herself consented or not wow listen to this point special punishments were also prescribed for depriving a prostitute's daughter of her virginity whether she herself consented or not the right of the mother was recognized by the the right of the mother was recognized by making the man pay not only a fine but also a compensation to the mother of six, mother of 16 16 times the fee for a visit uh, but also compensation to the mother of 16 times the fee for a visit an imbalance in punishments has to be noted the penalty for killing the madam of an establishment was three times was three times the release price and uh, and that for killing a prostitute in her establishment or her mother or daughter was only the highest standard penalty i'll have to explain this again uh, the penalty for killing the madam of an establishment was three times the release price and that and that for uh, was three times the release price it's, the sentence construction is a bit old school so it's confusing the penalty for killing the madam of an establishment was three times the release price and that for killing a prostitute in her establishment or her mother or daughter was only the highest standard penalty on the other hand if a prostitute killed a client she was burnt or drowned alive the expression bandhaki wait bandhaki poshaka okay bandhaki poshaka the expression bandhaki poshaka or keeper of prostitutes occurs thrice in the text associated always with young and beautiful women the keepers were obliged to use the women to collect money in times of emergency or to sow dissension among the chiefs of an oligarchy or to subvert the enemy's army chiefs now role and status of women <clears throat> reading the arthashastra the the question that naturally comes to mind is did women of kautilya's times enjoy more rights than they do today than they do today there can be no clear answer to this question because in some respects like remarriage or right to property women had a better position than what they came to have in the subsequent periods of indian history however in terms of subservience and dependence the principles and traditions were no different in this summary the verses relating to women have been collated under the following headings women as begetters of sons their right to property standards of sexual morality as it affected them their role in the labor force their legal status in contracts and suits and lastly dependency and subservience now women as begetter of sons begetters of sons the role of women is succinctly stated by cotilia as the aim of taking a wife is to beget sons from this principle of perpetuating the family line through sons others follow the frustration of a woman's fertile period is a violation of a sacred duty okay these quotes are from chanakya himself okay the frustration of a woman's fertile period 
is a violation of a sacred duty. A wife shall not conceal her fertile period and a husband shall not fail in his duty to try to get a son during his wife's fertile period. Okay, now the quote ends. Now we get back to the translator's writings. If a wife was barren for eight years or if she had borne only daughters over a 12-year period, the husband could take a second wife without paying compensation to the first or returning her dowry. When a man had more than one wife, when a man had more than one wife, the earliest surviving wife or the one who had borne many sons was given priority. The preoccupation with bearing sons also gave women some rights. A girl whose father was indifferent about her marriage for 3 years after her reaching puberty could find herself a husband, even one from another Varna. Likewise, a father lost his rights if he prevented his daughter's husband from approaching her for 7 periods. Among the reasons given for a wife's right to among the reasons given for a wife's right to refuse to have intercourse with her husband is that she had already borne him sons. If she has had sons, she has the right to refuse intercourse. The principle of perpetuation uh, the principle of perpetuation of the husband's family affected the rights of a widow to remarry. She could retain her husband's property only if she married a man from the husband's own family. Similar restrictions apply to the remarriage of a wife whose husband had gone on uh, whose husband had gone on a very long journey the cotillion order of preference for niyoga or levirate is a brother of the husband any sapinda or common ancestor with a, within three uh, any common ancestor within three generations male uh, any sapinda male and lastly the husband's kula the extended family the custom of a wife uh, the custom of a wife bearing a kshetraja son referred to earlier you can see that in previous videos the custom of a wife bearing a kshetraja son referred to earlier is a further indication of the importance attached to having sons lastly lastly though nuns of both brahmanical and non brahmanical orders are often mentioned it was a crime to induce a woman to renounce her role as a wife it was a crime to induce a woman to renounce her role as a wife wow you couldn't go around telling people that come become a nun you don't have to be wife <laughs> it was a crime women's right to property the principle is we are quoting chanakya now the purpose of giving women the right to own property is to afford protection in case of a calamity the quote ends this however was a right restricted on the whole to maintenance this is made clear in the order of inheritance specified in the text Uh, now the order of inheritance specified in the text is sons daughters the father of the deceased brothers and nephews then the widow uh, okay the uh, brothers and nephews the widow is nowhere mentioned as an inheritor a widow did not inherit all the property of her husband if there were no heirs the king took the property leaving only the amounts needed for her maintenance so it's not like she was going to be starving to death in general a woman had control over her dowry and jewelry In general a woman had control over her dowry and jewelry. She retained this control after the death of her husband as long as she did not remarry. Cool. If she remarried without the consent of her father-in-law, her new husband was obliged to return all her property to the other family. A remarrying widow was also obliged to leave her property at the time of remarriage. A remarrying widow was also obliged Okay, my camera's battery is working. A remarried a remarrying widow was also obliged to leave her property at the time of remarriage to the sons by the first marriage you have to leave that to your sons by the first marriage in short property passed down the male line except when there were only daughters okay if there were only daughters then it could pass down through daughters so it's not a problem there are references to rich widows one example is the case of an unjustly treated prince collecting money by plundering rich widows after gaining their confidence Secret agents posing as rich widows, secret agents posing as rich widows were used to sow dissension among the chiefs of an oligarchy or to draw the enemy from the safety of his sort. Sexual morality. The Arthashastra covers every aspect of sexual morality. Great emphasis is laid on virginity before marriage. There are also references to adultery, rape and abortion. Not being a virgin at the time of marriage was an offense punishable by a fine of 54 pund. If the bride pretended to be a virgin by spearing some blood, some other blood on the sheets during consummation, the fine was increased to 200 pun. Any man falsely accusing a girl of not being a virgin also had to pay a similar fine, and in addition lost the right to marry her. 
as a consequence of the emphasis on virginity for the girl defloration including defloration by a woman and auto defloration also became punishable offenses holy shit so a woman basically can't uh, masturbate or if she does masturbate she is it's illegal for her to lose her virginity in that way or with the help of another woman <coughs> Special provisions existed for the defloration of the daughters of slaves and courtesans. It is int- it is interesting to note that the Arthashastra defines the age of puberty for girls as 12 while for boys it is 16. Some types of sexual relations were prohibited. Incest, punishable by the by the mutil punishable by the mutilation of sexual organs and then death for the man and only death for the woman. Uh, uh, for the woman concerned a parent role. either the man as a father as in the, uh, as in uh, incest with a daughter or daughter in law or the woman in a role similar to that of a mother as in the cases of the teacher's wife a sister of the father or the mother and the wife of the maternal uncles other prohibited relations attracting punishments were for men with the queen an unprotected brahmin woman and a woman of ascetic okay for men these were the uh, prohibited relations with the queen or with Uh, unprotected brahmin women or with any woman ascetic for women uh, the 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 prohibited relationships were slaves and bonded males and for both it was prohibited that an arya could not have relations with a svapaka intercourse with a woman other than uh, through the vagina was a punishable offense the only reference to female homosexuality are defloration or rape and the only uh, references to hom- male homosexuality on the other hand male homosexuality on the other hand was a punishable offense the implication is that male sexual activity was meant only for procreation both husbands and wives were entitled to expect their spouses to fulfill their conjugal duties the punishment for the husband being double that for the wife <laughs> this may have been due to the fact that prostitution a state controlled revenue enhancing activity provided an alternative for men in fact a husband who falsely accused his wife of refusing to sleep with him was also punished adultery was treated as a serious crime see when you read the arthashastra and you read so many laws prohibiting these things and harsh crimes this does not mean that someone was going on committing these crimes or that someone was being punished all the time for these crimes these are just not even prescriptive this is just an ideal state recommended yeah by recommended it means prescriptive but it's not like a religious text it's not it's not your religious book that you have to follow word for word it's just a what if if you followed this is this, this was a manual for kings so we have so many laws it's not that someone is breaking some law uh, every time and someone is getting punished 24/7 it's not like that these are just the worst case scenarios adultery was treated as a serious crime the punishment for uh, the wife being the amputation of her nose and an ear adultery adultery's permission uh, punishment for women was amputation of her nose and an ear ear however if the adultery was committed when the husband was away on a long journey the wife was kept under custody by the husband's kinsmen till the husband's return when he had the option for when he had the husband when the husband has the option of forgiving both the wife and her lover till then she'll be with the with the uh, husband's family and uh, because if the husband was away if she does that while her husband is here she, her no- nose and can will be cut off different punishments are prescribed for the crime of rape depending on the victim 12 pun for raping a prostitute 24 pun for each offender in a gang rape of a prostitute and 100 pun for raping a woman living by herself the amputation of the middle and index fingers for raping a girl who had attained puberty the amputation of a hand if the girl had not attained puberty and death if the girl died as a result of the rape among crimes against women special punishments are prescribed for city guards who misbehave with women these range from lowest standard penalty if the woman was a slave to death if the woman was a respectable person Pregnancy carried with it some rights mainly in the interests of protecting the child. Causing abortion was a serious crime, the punishment varying from the lowest to the highest standard penalty depending on the means used, depending on the means of abortion. Procuring the abortion of a female slave also carried a punishment of the lowest standard penalty. Women were not to be tortured during pregnancy or for a month after childbirth. 
for a woman convicted of murder, the sentence of death by drowning was carried out a month after childbirth. Pregnant women could u- could use the ferries free of charge. Now, women's employment. Though the extent to which women were employed in the agricultural sector not uh, it's not clear f- from the text, it is likely that they also worked in the fields and pastures along with the men. A sector of employment reserved for women, particularly those who had no other means of livelihood, was spinning, charkha, weaving. The list given under the chief textile commissioner includes widows, crippled women, unmarried girls, women living independently, women working off fines, working off fines. So you you are fined for something, but you don't have the money to pay that fine. So you are working off that fine, OFF. And mothers of prostitutes, old women, servants of the king, and temple dancers whose services to a temple had ceased. These were the women for whom spinning was reserved. <clears throat> Special mention is made of women who did not stir out of their houses for reasons of modesty or inability, if they were handicapped or something. The list includes widows, handicapped women, unmarried girls, and those whose husbands were away on a journey. Work was sent out to such women by the chief textile commissioner through his own maid servants. They could also come to the yarn shed early in the morning when there was little traffic about. When they came, the official was obliged to do only what was necessary to hand over the raw material, receive the yarn and pay the wages. He was neither to look at a woman's face nor to engage in any conversation unrelated to work. He was supposed to be professional. Cotillard's concern for protecting the modesty of women was balanced by his concern for ensuring control over the decentralized spinning sector, with the work being done at home, unsupervised by an official. The prescribed punishment for cheating, or which, uh, for example, taking the wages but not doing the work or misappropriating the raw material, the punishment for such, cheat, for such cheating was drastic, cutting off the thumb and forefinger. Women and children were also employed in collecting and preparing and preparing the ingredients for making alcoholic liquor. They worked as attendants of the king and other nobles, their main occupations being shampooing, preparing the bath, making garlands and perfumery, and carrying the regalia of office, whatever the flag or little banners and hoardings and those things. That women were employed by the state for prostitution is obvious from the earlier discussion. There were other types of women entertainers, like actresses. The wives of actors, the wives of actors and other entertainers were also to be used under the cover of profession of their husbands to detect, delude, and murder the wicked. The use of women to delude or entrap enemies, both internal and external, was quite extensive. Reference was made earlier to the wandering nun belonging to a category of roving spies. A woman of bad character is mentioned as one to be used in trapping a treacherous high official by making her pretend to be the queen. (laughs) Women were thus used for a variety of nefarious purposes ranging from tempting a prince unjustly, tempting a prince who is unjustly treated to appear before his father or to sowing dissension among the chiefs of an oligarchy. The whole range of such activities of secret agents is given in part 9 of this translation. We will get to that later. The one area where women were protected by law was when they were bonded labor or slaves. A female bonded labor, a female bonded laborer was not to be beaten or treated violently or made to give a bath to a naked man or to be deprived of her virginity. If the maltreated woman was a nurse, a cook, a maid or an agricultural tenant, she was freed. A pledged nurse was not to be raped. A pledged nurse, a nurse who has uh, told people that I am a nurse, she was not to be raped. A master should neither himself rape nor let someone else rape a virgin girl under under his control. A woman laborer to whom a woman laborer to whom a child of the master was born was entitled to leave the household. A pregnant female slave was not to be sold or mortgaged without making adequate provision for her welfare during her pregnancy. Her pregnancy was not to be determined was her pregnancy was not to be terminated by abortion. When a slave gave birth to a child of her master, both she and her child were no longer considered to be slaves. So which which used to happen in in the American slavery scene a lot that uh, the master used to rape their their female slaves and as 
that's how many mixed uh, people were born uh, and many famous founding fathers not not all the founding fathers like some of them are the big names in the during the founding of the country in usa have had these histories but you have to remember that slave does not mean the same thing as it means in uh, west slave here means das dasa a, a servant one who serves anything so uh, one who is not doesn't have too many laws or facilities or or extra perks so lowly jobs uh, they could be considered slaves status in status of women in contracts and suits a contract made by a woman dependent on her husband or son was not valid in this the woman's status was equated with that of other dependent people such as slaves and bonded labor though contracts had normally to be entered into in public a contract for inheritance marriage or deposits was valid even if made inside a house provided one of the parties was a woman who did not normally leave her house for the purposes of the law of evidence a woman was classed with those who could be called upon as witnesses only with respect to cases involving their own group this did not apply to cases of theft assault adultery or secret transactions women were also included in the class of persons whose problems were to be looked into by judges judges suomoto if the judge hears about it he is going to take some steps for it now uh, dependence and, and subservience many aspects of the protection accorded to women were based on the inclusion of women in the list of people who needed the protection of the state because they were helpless and easily exploited it is a debatable point whether women as a segment of society would have needed this protection if society and the legal system had not placed them from the beginning in an inferior position i have something to say on this because uh, the, that they had an inferior position because of the uh, because of the value of physical strength which obviously they lack <clears throat> than men so overall the society had to be tilted in favor of men because uh so much physical work was required in 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 all of the professions and uh not all women would would uh would pursue such physical activities and therefore the society would be tilted against them and as capitalism uh, brings on pro- prosperity and reduces the importance of physical strength that's how women are now uh joining the workforce and stuff the underlying principle in the arthashastra is that a woman was always dependent on under the control of and subservient to her father her husband or her son in fact in the chapter on title to property women are included in the list of property along with deposits and pledges women are included in the list of property along with deposits and pledges so the uh, by property it's meant that uh, along with your other deposits and pledges pledges you are you are supposed to take care of this woman as well because she is completely dependent on you if you are the father the husband or the son a wife could not without the permission of her husband drink indulge in unseemly sports or go on pleasure trips she could not go to see performances with other men or even with other women either by day or at night she could not leave the house when her husband was asleep or drunk she could not refuse to open the door to him on the other hand a wife had certain rights so it's it's, it's a very gray time it's a very gray book you no one can say that arthashastra is completely good for anyone no one can say that arthashastra is completely bad for anyone as is the case of any any practical long surviving society so what are the rights of the wife the physical punishment which a husband could inflict on his wife was limited to 3 slaps she could run away from home if ill treated she had the right to run away from home if she was ill treated this is this sounds contradictory to the everything we heard up till now but only because our our use of words and terminologies have changed so much towards a a, a left wing feminist era a, a left wing feminist terminology lexicon but to to chanakya this probably does not seem contradictory he thinks yeah those are the facts i have to give these uh, rights uh, for women for men and then i'll give these rights to women she could run away from home if ill treated she could not be prevented from visiting her own family on special occasions like death illness or uh, childbirth some women who customarily enjoyed freedom of movement could travel with a man there you go Th- these are nuanced laws Th- this is not saudi arabia 
widows or wives whose and and that is 2300 years ago widows or wives whose husbands had gone on long journeys could remarry as we have discussed before uh, subject to specified conditions divorce was possible only in four of the eight uh, forms of marriage we will get to that later so there were eight kinds of marriages eight kinds of marriages and four of them were in four of them you were allowed to divorce that that's pretty progressive if you ask me the overall picture is thus one of women being placed in a subservient role but given adequate protection to ensure that this did not lead to total exploitation how well the safeguards operated in practice can only be a matter of conjecture because this this is not a historical document this is a recommendation a manual a guide book a handbook for kings inside the uh, dharmic civilizational state it is possible that gradual deterioration obviously over centuries in the legal protection guaranteed to women in the arthashastra led to their being given a lower status in later codifications like the manusmriti 